Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Saturday, 25 May, 2024. It is the 206th anniversary of the birth of Carl Jakob Christoph Burkhardt, who was born in Basel, Switzerland on this date in 1818. Burkhardt was a student of Leopold von Ranke and a teacher of Friedrich Nietzsche, which places him in a particular lineage of Germanophone history and philosophy. So in other words, both Burkhardt and his work in history themselves has histories, and all these histories are intertwined with other related lineages. Burkhardt kept up a correspondence with his former student, Nietzsche, and in a letter of 22 September 1886 to Burkhardt, written from Sils Maria, Nietzsche said of himself and Burkhardt, quote, I know nobody who shares with me as many prepossessions as you yourself. It seems to me that you have had the same problems in view, that you are working on the same problems in a similar way, perhaps even more forcefully and deeply than I, because you are less loquacious. But then I am younger. The mysterious conditions of any growth in culture, that extremely dubious relation between what is called the improvement of man or even humanization and the enlargement of the human type, above all, the contradiction between every moral concept and every scientific concept of life. Enough, enough. Here is a problem which we fortunately share with not many other persons living or dead, unquote. What exactly are these shared problems of Nietzsche and Burkhardt? Was Nietzsche thinking of himself as a historian and therefore sharing Burkhardt's problems as a historian? Or was Nietzsche thinking of Burkhardt as being an unprofessed philosopher who was engaged in the same philosophy problems that interested Nietzsche as a philosopher? Or was it something different or was it something more? What united the thought of Burkhardt and Nietzsche? It's difficult to say. A careful reading of the scholarly lineage of Ronka, Burkhardt and Nietzsche will reveal both the continuities and the divergencies that constitute this particular tradition of Germanophone history and philosophy. But like everything else that participates in history, Burkhardt's thought belonged to more than one tradition and can be categorized under more than one label. Hugh Trevor Roper compared Lord Acton to Burkhardt and Alexis de, to de Tocqueville, saying that they, quote, belonged to that unfashionable elite of the 19th century, the aristocratic historical pessimists, unquote. This tradition of unfashionable elites has its own continuities and divergencies, as with the tradition divined by the lineage of Ronka, Burkhardt, and Nietzsche. Nietzsche called Burkhardt a radical nihilist in one letter. Uh, in, in mentioning both Burkhardt and Taine, he said, quote, we are at root, all three committed to one another as three radical nihilists, unquote. Alan Kahan has called Burkhardt an aristocratic liberal in his book, Aristocratic Liberalism, The Social and Political Thought of Jakob Burkhardt, John Stuart, John Stuart Mill, and Alexis de Tocqueville. And here is another categorization from Thomas Albert Howard's Religion and the Rise of Historicism. Quote, rooted in Basel's conservative religious heritage, Burkhardt's pessimism has in fact a profoundly Christian and explicitly pre-modern Christian pedigree. It may be described as a secularized continuation of the idea of original sin, an abiding attachment to the orthodox world of his father. Burkhardt does not stress the ontological basis of this idea, human guilt and sin consciousness, but rather its social consequences, the notion, as Linwood Urban states, that all human thought and action stem from an un uninherited, bruised, and damaged nature that has distorted and perverted their wills and desires, unquote. No doubt one could find um, uh, many other categories that have been used in the attempt to pigeonhole Burkhart, but we can see that Burkhart was an elusive thinker. We can all agree that he was a historian, but he seems to have been more than a historian. But in what this more consists, it's not at all clear. We hesitate to call him a philosopher of history since Burkhardt himself explicitly disclaimed any philosophy of history. Quote, we have nothing to do with philosophy of history, unquote. Nietzsche wrote of Burkhardt in a letter to Erwin Road during February 1872, quote, he who keeps energetically at arm's length everything philosophical and, above all, everything to do with philosophy of art, unquote. This theme of Burkhart keeping philosophy at a distance is also 
found in Carl Lovett. The first chapter of Carl Lovett's meaning in history is concerned with Burkhart, and there is something particularly appropriate about this. Lovett's book is more a non-philosophy of history than a philosophy of history, or you could call it a denial of the very possibility of a philosophy of history. Burkhart doesn't go that far, uh, you could say, as denying the very possibility of a philosophy of history, but he belongs in a category not unlike Lovett. Given Burkhart's elusiveness, and because of his explicit denial of having a philosophy of history like Lovett, I call Burkhart a non-philosopher of history, along with Descartes and Simone Vai. Burkhardt himself was a, was a historian, so we can play the game of the practicing historian who eschews philosophy, or perhaps was too busy with history to spare time to reflect on his discipline. Of Burkhardt, Lovett wrote, quote, there is some kind of permanence in the very flux of history, namely its continuity. This is the only principle discernible in Burkhardt's reflections on history, the one thin thread that holds together his observations after he has dismissed the systematic interpretations by philosophy and theology. The whole significance of history depends for Burkhardt on continuity as the common standard of all particular historical evaluations. If a radical crisis really disrupted historical's continuity, it would be the end of a historical epoch but not a historical crisis, unquote. Continuity, then, is the slender thread of Burkhardt's conception of history. Later in the same chapter, Levitt notes the inadequacy of this minimalist philosophy of history. Quote, on the basis of such an outlook, neither a philosophy nor a theology of history can be constructed. The thin thread of mere continuity without beginning, progress, and end does not support such a system, unquote. This serves Lovett's end as a denial of the possibility of a legitimate philosophy of history, but still, we come back to Burkhart time and again, and we find insights into history that we do not find elsewhere. It is in the nature of the rational mind to seek order and pattern, so we seek order and pattern in the thoughts of Jakob Burkhart, no less than we uh, philosophers of history seek to find order and pattern in the events of history. Less timid in finding a definite point of view in Burkhart than Lovett is Egon Flagg, who finds in Burkhart three premises that, in, that formed his conception of history, as well as his warning to the world concerning history yet to come. Quote, Burkhart's conception of contemporary history revolves around three premises. He postulates first that no distinction exists between radical and representative democracy. Any kind of restraint that the principle of representation might impose on the will of the masses ultimately fails to be effective due to the basic sovereignty of the people in all types of democratic government. Secondly, that political equality inevitably produces the desire for social equality and that the fight for social equality that ensues throws society into class struggles. And thirdly, that class struggles dramatically lower the moral standard of society as a whole. They generate a historical constellation in which social life falls increasingly under the sway of base material motives that lack any cultural dimension whatsoever. At that point, the danger arises that outright civil wars will tear the very fabric of society into pieces." Unquote. In several places, Burkhart forecasts difficult times ahead for Europe. And perhaps this is to be understood as the pessimism that is frequently attributed to him. But Burkhardt also saw that there would be recovery after the, the difficult times. So you can see he sort of tends in the direction of a, a cyclical view of history, both in this uh, quote from uh, Egon Flagg that I just wrote about the, the cycles of, of the political cycles that resembles an, an ancient conception, and in in uh, in his uh, in his pessimism, there is a famous passage from uh, one of Burkhardt's letters to Hermann Schauenberg from twenty eight February eighteen forty six, which both warns of times to come, but also looks forward to what to what can be rebuilt from the ashes. Quote. Before universal, universal barbarism breaks in, and for the moment I can see, foresee nothing else, 
I want to debauch myself with a real Eiffel of aristocratic culture so that when the social revolution has exhausted itself for a moment, I shall be able to take active part in the inevitable restoration, if the Lord wills and we live, of course. Just wait and you will see the sort of spirits that are going to rise out of the ground during the next 20 years. Those who now hop about in front of the curtain, the communist poets and painters and their like, the mere bajazi just prepping, preparing the public, you, you, none of you know as yet what the people are and how easily they turn into the barbarian horde. You don't know what a tyranny is going to be exercised you on the spirit, exercised on the spirit, on the pretext that culture is the ally of capital, that it must be destroyed. Those who hope to direct the movement with the help of their philosophy and keep on the right lines seem to me completely idiotic. They are the feelings of the coming movement. And like the French Revolution, it will develop like a natural phenomenon involving everything that is hellish in human nature. I do not want to experience those times unless I am obliged to do so, for I want to be able to save things as far as my humble station allows. For you, I have no fears. I know well enough on which side events will find you. We may all perish, but at least I want to discover the interest for which I am to perish, namely the old culture of Europe. It seems to me as though when the time comes, we should meet in the same holy company. Shake yourself free from your illusions, Herman. Out of the storm, a new existence will arise, formed, that is, upon old and new foundations, that is your place and not in the forefront of irresponsible action. Our destiny is to help build anew when the crisis is past, unquote. You can read this as optimism or pessimism, as you prefer. Obviously, uh, Burkhart does not look out on the coming years with, with optimism, but he also says repeatedly that something new will arise from the ashes. It's only from the enlightenment perspective that insists that all history must be progress, and which is nearly a universal presupposition that Burkhart seems to have escaped, that a near-term catastrophe is problematic, even if it's dressed up in the most wonderful slogans as it unfolds and is eventually superseded by restoration and rebuilding. The most famous work of Burkhart is unquestionably the civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, originally published in 1860. The title of the book is includes Renaissance. Burkhart did not write the civilization of early modern Italy, but this change came along uh, long after Burkhardt's time. Western historians have traditionally worked from a tripartite periodization of Western history into ancient, medieval, and modern, with modern history further subdivided into the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Romantic Era, and modernity. These familiar periodizations are, of course, ripe with ambiguity. Modern can mean the period following Romanticism, or it can mean the entire period since the end of the Middle Ages. The rechristening of the beginnings of modernism as early modern usually covers the period of approximately 1500 to 1800, and so includes not only the Renaissance, but the Reformation and much of the Enlightenment as well. Burkhardt's work brought the idea of the Renaissance, and especially the Italian Renaissance, to prominence, and partly this was the, the fact of his historical historically isolating some persons and events in Italy and grouping them together in the periodization of the Renaissance. Historians in the 20th century began to de-emphasize the Renaissance and preferred early no the early modern nomenclature, but works like Burkhardt's History of the Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy and Walter Pater's The Renaissance will not entirely allow the idea of the Renaissance to die. Of periodization, Burkhardt says in the introduction to the civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, quote, it is the most serious difficulty of the history of civilization that a great intellectual process must be broken up into single and often into what seem arbitrary categories in order to be in any way intelligible, unquote. Periodization and continuity are two forces in tension in history. The historian needs to legitimize the period he has chosen to narrate erecting a periodization or relying on some existing periodization, 
but he also needs to show the continuity within the period in question, as well as the continuity that connects a given period to both to the period that preceded it and to the period that follows it. In the passage I just quoted, Burkhardt says that periods seem to seem like arbitrary categories, implying that there may be a reality somewhere behind the seeming. And that sets up the possibility of a metaphysics of history that can be make a distinction between historical appearance and historical reality. Presumably, the, the ultimate uh, periodization of history would, would, as it were, carve history at the joints and give us historical reality, if only that were possible. I discussed some of these problems of periodization also in my episode on Petrarch's Ascent of Mount Ventoux. So if that interests you, you might consider listening to that. The source of most of Burkhardt's thought on history, apart from the actual histories he wrote of Constantine and the Italian Renaissance, are his lecture notes, which were posthumously published as Reflections on History, although they've been published in under many titles uh, in the subsequent uh, couple of hundred years. They include a short work of interconnected remarks known as On Fortune and Misfortune in History, which is perhaps the most compact expression of Burkhardt's views. And it is an enigmatic work like the rest of Burkhardt's comments on history. Here again, we find a reflection on continuity, quote, the most justified indictments which we seem to have the right to bring against fate are those which concern the destruction of great works of art and literature. We might possibly be ready to forego the learning of the ancient world, the libraries of Alexandria and Pergamum. We have enough to do to cope with the learning of modern times, but we mourn for the supreme poets whose works have been lost and the historians too represent an irreparable loss because the continuity of intellectual tradition has become fragmentary over long and important periods. But that continuity is a prime concern of man's earthly life and a metaphysical proof of the significance of its duration. For whether a spiritual continuity existed without our knowledge in an organ unknown to us, we cannot tell, and in any case, cannot imagine it. Hence, we most urgently desire that the awareness of that continuity should remain living in our minds, unquote. And we also find such frankly philosophical remarks as this, quote, since mind, like matter, is mutable, and the changes of time bear away ceaselessly the forms which are the vest vesture of material as of spiritual life, the task of history as a whole is to show its twin aspects, distinct yet identical, proceeding from the fact that, firstly, the spiritual, in whatever domain it is perceived, has a historical aspect under which it appears as change, as the contingent, as a passing moment which forms part of a vast whole beyond our power to divine, and that, secondly, every event has a spiritual act aspect by which it partakes of immortality." Unquote. Much could be made of these and other passages for anyone who wished to read Burkhart carefully and to recover from his scattered observations, a coherent conception of history. There are many constructions we could build on this tentative and uncertain foundation, but Burkhart himself chose not to build any further on these thoughts. Perhaps the ultimate value of Burkhart's perspective is to be found in the very ambiguity of his amb engagement with the larger concepts of history. Every explicit claim is countered by another claim of apparently equal weight. And this is how the historian weighs history. He takes a position neither for or against the processes of history. He sees the spectacle, spectacle of history, and if he is true to the discipline, he sees it for what it is. Happy birthday, Jakob Burkhart, and thanks for listening.